Uh, okay, so let's get started. Uh, this was posted on the Google uh, community group, which I, su I suggest all of you join. Um, it's a great place to get feedback from from your peers, not necessarily always from me. It's good to get a fresh a fresh set of eyes on uh, on an image that you're working on. So what I wrote um, in this for this one was that the way you really really Photoshop. <clears throat> what I wrote is that the way you painted the nostrils, it was a bit too stated. Um, everything else was kind of rendered and the nostrils were still in their raw early brush stroke phase, um, stage, whatever. So um, we needed to... Where's that thingamabob that I was looking at? Okay. We needed to go in... And... Uh, and lighten those up a little and place the darkness only where we need it so first and foremost they have to be symmetrical it's like the staple of, of nose beauty is symmetry so what I'm doing with very light opacity building the plate on which I will, I will, I will place the darkest part I might sneeze god damn it the darkest part of uh, of the nostril, not which is not just yet. I'm still kind of just setting the stage. Okay, I'm gonna bring in the secondary light source. If you don't know what that is and where to place it, I do have a video on YouTube on how to paint noses, and it pretty much explains everything there. Um, I'm going to carry the color of the cheek all the way to the sides of the nose, just like this, because the nose is a separate part from the face. And once I define the nostrils and where they end, that way, after that I can sort of define the shadow. And the shadow cannot be as dark or as um, contrasted, damn it, as the... Uh, as the nose itself, so we have to bring this shadow down, and we've lightened it up the 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 outmost we go, so that the shadow gets a little bit more um it behaves as if it was an actual cast shadow on a form study. So we apply all the rules to it; it's not exempt from it. Just because it's on skin, it doesn't mean that the shadow behaves differently. It doesn't matter what the what the cast shadow shines on, what kind of material, cast shadows act the same there. It's a consistent rule throughout throughout materials. Cast shadows are exempt from any material rules. So the physics behind cast shadows is exempt. The fact that the closer you get to uh, the object, the more distant you get from the light source. The way that affects a cast shadow and its, its look is consistent throughout materials. I'm just going to place a little bit of a light on the cupid's bow. Just like this. I'll zoom out a little. Sorry, guys. I hope this is class streaming and not, um, not league streaming, because then the quality will be bad. Okay, so I'm just, um, Thinking about uh, the hills and valleys of the, the the cupid's bow. There's also a shiny part on it that you might want to light up just a little bit. And there is a shiny ring sort of around lips, but they're not. It's not like a constant outline. It's only shining when there's light on it. It's like an extra reflective stretch of skin. There's also the little space between the nostrils that casts its own shadow, just like that. But you can't just use a line like that, you have to sort of build it up. <clears throat> and there's the top of the nostrils that get some light and interrupt that, that shade that they have, just like that. And that's pretty much it. You can also add in the, the grooves that break the nose. And you carry that color all the way up, or that shade all the way up. Also, don't over darken the sides of the face if you're using the, the 14 day challenge light source. You don't darken um, 
the sides of the nostrils because you're using a certain kind of light source that doesn't allow the sides of the nostrils to be that dark. Also frame off the sides of the face and you do have a nice beautiful uh, core shadow on half of the face which is really good. And make sure that you place the lights of the cheeks only where they need to be. Bringing in some light on the chin, some light on the lips, wherever they face up. Those are the kinds of lips, sort of, that you drew. Because I'm not making sure they don't look like fangs. Continuing the shadow in between um, between these two eyebrows, and then remember the on switch. The on switch doesn't just uh, stay on just the top of the forehead. The light of the forehead, the light spot there, doesn't just stay and hover there. This dark spot carries a little bit higher, and that carries through the eyebrows, and that's where we get the light under the eyebrow. And I'm very sorry about canceling yesterday's class. Um, it's just this change of weather, and we live by the lake, and it's just a, it's, it's a butt. That's what it is, a butt. All right, so I'm just going to try to keep it symmetrical on either side, just like this. And then the, the, the upper eyelid also needs some light on it, only where the light catches. So there's a cast shadow right here, so the light only starts there. So just like that. And I'm going to place some light on the lower uh, waterline. Again, where the light starts. So this, this whole area here is a shadow. Just some minor corrections here. And this eyelid is actually going to cover up. So the waterline that you drew carries way too far to the outer edge. Um, the waterline mostly is visible near the middle. Good job on the lower eyelids. Make sure you're not just drawing a, a raccoon eye, though. Make sure that you gradually build it up. And this kind of bleeds into this eye. And with eyelids, it's mostly just this part here. It is a change of shade, but it's uh, it's also this little edge here that doesn't blend. It's very similar to the upper eyelid edge. Just like so. And also blend that. So it's just a smudge tool on a scatter brush, something that I would probably do if I was sketching by hand with my hand. Um, be right back one second. Sorry I'm not looking at the comments, I'll look at them in a second. And this, this dark spot here, so you've got all your dark spots set up really nicely. Um, you still, the dark spot of the eyes is, is like a big system, it's not just one dark spot. The dark spot is sort of the introductory shade that you use when you're painting. But it is essentially around the, the, the pupil. But the eye, uh, eyelashes are also part of the dark spot system of the eyes. How dark their hair is, which is, I'm just looking at the eyebrows, is how dark those um, lashes should be. So, a bit of work on the, uh, on the nose, and it already looks very different. I'm placing in a lighter shade for the inner waterline, that inner corner of the eye. This is something that you also need to do. You cannot replace it with a dark shade, or else it will look like mascara gunk. You know that stuff that scared Chandler? <laughs> I don't know why I remember that, but um, it looked like mascara residue collected on the inner corner. <laughs> it's kind of gross. 
Uh, but that's that's what it'll read as. It'll read as excess makeup or rogue makeup, or it'll look like you're outlining. So what you need to do is, is again look at the reference and look at how it looks when it's just natural, and that's uh, pretty much what you, should, what you should be doing. tip right up here before it ends there's a tiny little sliver usually when the nose gets sharpest along the bridge and eyebrows usually share the same shade on the inner part of the eyebrow and I'm only um, and I'm actually going to darken the inner part of the eyebrow as well to have its own shade because there's more clusters of hair I'm only uh, critiquing these 14 day challenges once they reach a close so I might give you a critique on the 14th day, I might give you a critique on the um, on the 12th or 11th day or something, 13th day. Uh, but this is not something that I offer regularly, so I'm not going to critique every one of your days. That's something I throw only in private tutoring. But it's in, sort of, for me, encouraging others who don't, who can't afford private tutoring to still try the 14 day challenge anyway, because I don't want to strip you guys of the right, you know, to, to, to try it out. And, you know, you can only really get it in this community. Um, so join the Google community and get to working on your on your 14 day challenges and I will give you a critique on them and maybe that'll help you uh, before your 14th day because I don't want to give it I know this is um, day 11 I won't give a critique on the 14th day because there's no point we're supposed to be comparing day 1 and day 14 so go and try it have some courage and try it it's a really great exercise it forces you to paint a face every day for 14 days <clears throat> okay, now I'm going to zoom out, I'm going to make a new layer, and I'm going to brush this gray over everything, and delete what I only what I don't need, meaning I'm going to place light only where I need it, so I'm going to keep everything generally neutral, I'm going to get my eraser brush on soft, <coughs> excuse me, let me cough, I'm going to put my eraser brush on soft, and uh, soft brush, and I'm just going to erase away along the important light spots. Remember there are dark spots and there are light spots. Don't forget the, the light spots. They are the equal equivalent, the opposite, the equal opposite of the dark spots. They are the points wet that reach the sun or, or point to the sun or the peaks of the mountains, whereas the dark spots are the valleys. And I'm just erasing areas that are that require brightness because of their position or their form. So the nose sticks out the most, catching the most light. Okay, and I'm just gonna continue. So before, after, there's a there's a touch more control over the, 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 the exposure. In a camera, this would be high exposure. It wouldn't look very good. What we want to do is always uh, moderate in painting the, the grayscale ladder. So I've explained in a previous video what a grayscale ladder is. A grayscale ladder is how quickly you go to the next shade. Um, uh, meaning, like, you go from light gray to super dark gray, or like, you know, onyx gray. Um, that's called a really steep, uh, steep, that's called a really steep, uh, grayscale ladder, meaning you go from dark to light too soon, which is a high contrast, which doesn't make sense to certain materials, especially skin. Skin is a very mattified gray tone, no matter what kind of, what kind of race you're dealing with, it's always a really mattified gray, desaturated kind of color, even if you're dealing with African skin tone. Um, so always remember that, a certain kind of material, certain kinds of materials um, require certain saturation, I mean certain kind of materials require certain contrast levels and skin is one of those materials that doesn't require high contrast. I want you all to write that back at me in the chat because I want to know you guys are are, uh, are listening. <laughs> and um, that was in context, me saying kill your baby, that was context, don't, don't quote me on that. <laughs> that was me talking about your paintings and letting go and Moving on, but please write that down um, and say it back to me for those who listened. And you get a sticker. I'm going to darken just the inner, I mean just the outer, very most corner where the lashes would sit. And then I'm going to take that from the corner of the eye and carry it out 
because that's where the socket starts just out there and I'm going to take that light switch, that, that on switch light shoe horse shape and I'm going to carry it over the eyebrows and just look, like come on, just look at what just happened. We have an understructure of the forehead and the skeleton there. And I'm going to darken just the outer bits of the eyebrow. And then we have the shape on top, this beautiful obedient eyebrow that's on top that's respecting the light source it's sitting in. So what it's done is it's built up this, this, uh, this material comparison. So hair is more reflective than skin. And what's happened is that the hair has raised in value where the on switch has touched it. And the on switch has touched it because the, the forehead sticks out like that. Look at that beautiful relationship of, of materials stacking materials. I'm going to place a light running over the lower half of the eye to push that feeling of liquid and moisture. And very very balanced dark spots. Now that I've balanced the dark spots here I can balance them everywhere else so the darkest spot on the nose is going to be just at the very tip, very edge. That's where it gets deepest. That's where you start, you know, where, that's where you're you're picking your nose, that's when <laughs> um, it starts walking, like going through. It's, it, that's the spot. It doesn't. It's not a hole that you look at like it was if, if it was a pig's nose. It's a bit more hidden, more of a modest nose that humans have. <clears throat> if, if you're Dwight Schrute, it's very different. All right. So let's see what you, you vagabonds, wrote back to me. Um, skin is a material that doesn't require high contrast. Certain materials do not require high contrast. Skin is not high contrast. Um, you should not paint skin with high contrast. Skin requires no high contrast. Um, um, yes, yes, it's an area of low contrast. Wow, I was first end and I had the right wording. Y'all weak at typing. <laughs> That's right, Devin. You tell them. Um, uh, my account won't let me paint. Um, me too. Uh, okay, so that's it. Thank you guys. Um, so that's basically what I'm saying is avoid the high contrast. So if you do need it in areas of high contrast on the face, which are, and these are the exceptions to the rule, the nose, the forehead, and the lips and the eyes. These are all areas of a high moisture. This is oil. It's called your T-zone. It's what gets pimples the fastest. Urgh, I fucking pimples. Um, anywhere, I'm currently suffering from some, <laughs> anywhere on your face, um, this is where you get them. And uh, that's pretty much the, the rule of thumb, is that only areas of moisture can have areas of high contrast. Um, and that's pretty much it for this critique. Alright, so let's see if you guys have any questions. If you guys have any questions regarding this this uh, this this 14 day challenge, so before a little washed out, a little high contrast. After we've built up this really really nice grayscale ladder, and now if you want to go really dark, like look how light you are in your in your dark spots. If you want to go really dark on the dark spots, you can because you've built a really nice grayscale plate, just like we did with the nose. Look at that. I've only darkened the eyes and look what it's done to the ladder. It's 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 feeling like skin. And this is extremely helpful and I want you guys to write back what I'm about to say. So get ready to write it back to me. Skin requires low contrast because if you're working in grayscale right now and you're going to be transferring the grayscale to color, if you use a high contrast, you're going to get muddy colors. You're going to get a, a skin tone that needs so much red so it's going to start looking brown and barky before it starts looking like skin because the skin tone you chose was too dark or the medium tone you chose was just fine but the highlight tone was way too high so you have to bring in this oddly saturated yellow orange before it starts reading like a real um, you know like a, a, a light beige or a yellow affected beige and I talk about all of these rules in my in my YouTube video so please go there if you guys don't know what I'm talking about get yourself first with sort of the discourse of our community um, so that you understand me a little bit better. Um, but anyways, uh, that's pretty much the, the, the other best, the best thing about 
um, the other reason why you should stay low contrast in your painting faces is that when you transfer them over you will have less muddy, you will have a nice looking realistic looking uh, skin tone in the image and um, that's really important that's something that a lot of you have been having trouble with as I've been seeing from the community you guys have been giving me these uh, skin tones just like this one is way way too saturated it's because of the high contrast pretty much that you have here um, that we might touch on if I have time for the sides of the lips please kinda taper them off the corners of the lips taper them off to combine and uh, blend sort of with the sides of the, the cheek don't just leave it as one line. It will read to an extent, but then if you render far enough anywhere else on the face, it'll um, it'll start to look a little cartoony with that line. Also, the lips are wide. Um, the lips are a little wide, but you have faces in real life that have this. So I'm not going to criticize the fact that you've made them a little bit wide. However, you can't use this everywhere. And if you want to be hired, if you want to work for the industry, um, a disgusting industry, um, then you um, you gotta learn the cuteness triangle. You gotta learn how to make a face look very beautiful and very cute. And one of the first rules is a smaller mouth. It's basically realistic anime. Um, kinda hurts me to say that, but it's that's pretty much what it is. So that's what we wanna do. Lower the, the length of the bottom lip so it doesn't look like she's puckering. And um, before, after. So that's an option if you would like to take that route. It's not necessary. What you drew before happens in real life. But uh, if you want to go that route. There's also the secondary light source that's required on the sides of faces. And it's just very, very gently. You can make a new layer to make it easier. And what we're seeing here is just a small little touch, a clash between the values, just so that we see. Enough of the, the, the white wall beside her, so she's basically standing against a gray wall is what you're learning. And that's why the backgrounds in 14 day challenges have to be gray walls or light gray walls uh, because everything is pretty much that's pretty much like the middle ground of any background you're ever going to deal with and it's also giving you a chance to deal with secondary light source and diffuse light so uh, that's always good and the ears whoops. so let me show you before and after before after the face feels a little bit more three-dimensional this is too dark <clears throat> Lighten that up. Neck. Lighten that up as well. Okay, so I don't have time to cover the neck, but that's pretty much it. And uh, the ears. I was going to do the ears real quick. Just tucking that lower lobe in. You don't want it, look, want it to, to look too, uh, too stated. Most of the time you won't be, won't be painting the ear. If you ever do have to deal with anatomy that you're not familiar with, uh, the simple answer is picking up a reference. Don't just wait for your visual library to give you a sort of Picasso version of it. And of course that lightens up because of subsurface scattering. There's always subsurface scattering happening in, uh, in see-through material. It's just we don't see it because it's not enough. The transparent material, the point is that it's transparent because there's light moving through it. So that's called subsurface scattering when there's light beneath shining through the object. A bunch of light traveling through it. It's not really subsurface, it's just through the object. It looks like it's traveling through the surface. But it also um, happens with, with uh, nostrils as well. <clears throat> okay, so I'm just going to um, clean this up one moment. It's a little patchy here. It's 
anyone else looking forward to the fall as much as I am? <clears throat> it's mostly, it's not really like uh, any pumpkin spice crap that people look forward to in the fall. Um, it's, uh, it's like the colors, you know, everything has a new palette. That's like, um, it's amazing how we're given that, that sort of changes of nature, seasons. I don't know how I could ever live somewhere where the seasons and the palette doesn't change. Like, it's, it's pretty much like North America, like, um, uh, like on the level where New York is, is the best place to live <laughs> on the world. It depends on the tilt, really, but, uh, the Earth's tilt, but it's pretty much the best place, because you get the snow, and you get the sun, and you get the, you get those nice hot days, and then you also get to, get a chance to miss the sun and miss the summer, but you also get a chance to miss the snow, and it's like, it never gets old. It's like good food for an artist. See, so yeah, I can't wait for the trees to turn orange and those really hot reds and and purples. It's just gonna look so pretty and inspiring. Okay, so I'm just cleaning that up. Texas has two seasons, the hot one and the other one, which is absolutely hot. <laughs> Yeah, Emmanuel. I don't know where you live, but I know some people don't get winter, and I'm, I'm so sorry for you, for you who watch that don't have winter where you where you live. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you guys need some winter. Oh my God, I want to live near Seattle. I want to live in Seattle because of the rain. I know there's always rain in that Washington area. It's probably the wettest place in the United States. That whole um, that whole longitude not longitude latitude line. It's like it's always got rain. I absolutely want to live there someday. Just for the rain. Or move to the UK. I don't know which one, but I will follow the rain wherever it goes. <clears throat> Chicago's like a swampy New York. I love that. We don't have seasons. We have rain all year round. We're in, Ir in Ireland? In Irish? <laughs> in Angerland? Ew, Saudi Arabia. <laughs> I lived in Saudi Arabia for five years. When I was young, and I remember those hot days. There was one monsoon that we had. I don't know how it happened. We were South Saudi Arabia, so I guess that's why it happens. But uh, the whole desert area that we lived in just flooded. We were walking around and like half. I had to be carried because kids couldn't walk because they drowned. That's how deep it was, and it was all muddy and stuff. <clears throat> I could talk about the weather all day. People call it small talk. I call it the most interesting talk in the world. I love weather. Anyways, let's look at the before and after. <coughs> Excuse me. Before. You see, I just want you to look at the nose. That's what I really want you to see. After. It's mostly the way the nose became built up. The key lights that I placed. So when I do the before and after again, I want you to focus on these lights. This space. This this is just a stylus. This is how I know how to draw noses, but if you want to get rid of that, go ahead and leave just the open space here. It doesn't matter what kind of nose you paint. These are the key elements of the nose. It can be like the biggest nose ever. Before. After. The nose feels like it's moving outward, and this isn't even a steep climb. I mean, we can make it steeper. We can bring in more contrast. And we can really make this nose pop, but we don't need to because it's you know it's, it's going to look so pretty with the eyes attracting all the attention, and that's what you want to do in portraiture. Unless you want to get intentionally like blot out the eyes and make the lips super beautiful, because I've seen artists do that as well, or um, or completely gray out the eyes, um, just like so. And for some reason, the the image is still carried because they they go and sharpen everything else in the image and the image still carries. So it's just about choosing which one is going to be the focal point and uh, which one is going to <clears throat> which one's going to just sort of step back which set. So before after <clears throat> Uh, question, what does locking a layer do? You can't do anything on it, yeah. This just means that this layer's off limits. Yeah, it is a great invention. I also like the transparency one here. 
um, where if you get a brush and you want to change that color you just click on the transparency lock and now you can paint within it as much as you want and you won't lose that outline. It's like using the lasso tool but the lasso is kind of messy and you get the marching ants. A friend of mine taught me this. I've just been using it since. I haven't touched the lasso for so long. <laughs> it's a great um, tool. <clears throat> okay. Alright, so any questions at all? I know most of this is stuff that I uh, that I've taught before, so yeah, um, Devin, repetition is perfection. Um, but any questions? We're gonna have to sort of wait. Sorry, YouTubers, I'm gonna have to wait because there's quite a lag. It'll give me a chance to drink some hot water that I don't have because I didn't make it because I forgot. Excuse me. Um, Devin had a question further up in chat. Um, Devin, 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 Devin. Um, Isbrak, I have a question about head shape. I like the way the top of the head connects to the jaw. Like the way the top of the head connects to the jaw, that shape always confuses me. The way the top of the head connects to the jaw, you mean the way it builds up down, like the, like uh, like this. Mostly this is thicker than this, and this is just the mid 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 zone. So really, that's pretty much what you follow. Um, it's different proportions for babies. It's babies. It's a steeper. So you get the baby face earlier. Um, for adults, it's sort of widened, so you get like a, a longer. So you get the cranium, and then you get the lower bit, and then you just connect them together. If you want to sort of have a better way of sketching the head, that makes sure you have um, a good sort of head shape is if you um, draw the circle first, and don't just depend on this circle to be the shape of the head for you. Never do that, because the head isn't, it's not, it's not circular, so why use a sphere to start off a head? The only thing spherical about the head is pretty much the skull at the very top where the brain hides. What I do next is I place a circle on the bottom. Uh, if I'm doing caricatures mostly, this is what I'll do, but if I'm drawing a human head, I'll probably place, place this front part of the chin, if this is three-quarter view, and I connect it up this way, or I connect it this way, so that I remember there's a side that we don't see. So we've got one, two, three, and the other side is the fourth, and this is only three of them, so it's three, three-fourths, or three-quarter view. For front view, um, it's the same deal. Just choose where the chin is and connect back up. You're automatically building the, the chin as the smallest or thinnest area and the cranium sort of as the as the thickest area. And if you want to know where the neck starts, the neck starts where the jaw starts. So remember, if you're looking at a skeleton, um, the skeleton jaw is disconnected. What the hell did I just draw? It's Halloween soon, so I'm going to go away with it. Um, this, the, this jaw area, what we talk, the thing we talk and chew with, is the only thing that moves in the head. <clears throat> and the neck is what controls the head. Like, the head is pretty just, it's just one big stupid not moving structure that's just really hard and protects the brain <clears throat> but the, the things that do the most moving are the neck and the jawline so these areas are pretty much connected so if you find where the jawline is like if you've drawn the lip give a little bit of a hint for the jawline so it's not a perfect it's not a perfect like round off there's always a little angle an interruption and that's where the jaw is that's where that little bit of jaw sits that moves when we eat have you noticed? Your head isn't moving, it's your jaw. And then this right here, that's where the neck sort of starts from. Even in females, it can be a little bit more slender in females. It's slender because of lack of muscle. Even in men who are, who are more slender than others, it's a lack of muscle. But if you want to draw more burly men, just make a thicker neck. But it always starts where the, where the jaw starts. So just thinking about that, you'll pretty much know how to connect this part 
down to this part. You know there's a jaw that you have to go through. You know the chin has to be the closing point. <clears throat> you know you have to preserve symmetry so it's going to be pretty much easy to distribute. That's not symmetry. Um, it's going to be easier to distribute the sizes on either side. And this symmetry line is consistent all the way over here to the other side of the nose. What the hell did I just show? Okay. So does that help you, Devin? <coughs> A Canadian skeleton. <laughs> how do you know how and where to place subsurface scattering? Subsurface scattering is dependent on the material. So if it's a transparent material, it will, it will be subject to subsurface scattering. If the material has a color, that color will be saturated because the light will be saturated in that area. So if your ear has an undertone of red because of the blood, then the light shining through it will give it a light pink hue. If you have a glass, it's not really a glass, it's like a plastic cup of water that you hold up to the sunlight, it's going to be extra blue when you hold it up to the sun because that's the light tra traveling and being trapped within the confines of the transparent material. Um, so that's pretty much uh, <clears throat> that's pretty much what you need to do is to just determine the kind of material it is, the transparency of the material and the color of the material and the intensity of the light shining on it and you pretty much know what to do in areas of subsurface scattering. That's how you do it. It's better just to build your visual library with, um, with, with references. Um, I'm not sure I have time for the others. Uh, this person, I gave them a critique and they applied the corrections and I also wrote a little blurb for them, but I'm just going to brush over what I meant while I still have time. This shoulder needs to come back here. And this whole chest area needs to be pushed forward just a little bit. This hip is a little compressed. This one is a little compressed. I'm going to push it out and this one is a little out. So your entire an an anatomy was sort of out, sort of falling or melting off. I'm going to push the chin back in. And you don't want to make it seem like the head is always being pushed forward, like he's trying to push his chin out. So before, after. He's quite a skinny boy. And then of course the head size. Um, increase the density. <clears throat> Okay, so before, after, let me sharpen that. <clears throat> Alright, so before, after. It's the same character, we've just um, rounded off his, uh, his anatomy, he's got a more straight age going on. Um, meaning like it's, it's more of a determinable age, it's quite young. Great use of references. Amazing use of references. I love how you did the collarbones. Amazing work. Um, don't, don't do this. Just you know, as a suggestion, design-wise, you don't need that border. Just let the image sit for itself. Let it, let it go. Um, you really don't need it. I mean, I'm not even so sure about this kind of canvas. You might want to just enlarge the canvas upward and then have him centered somewhere in it. Um, standing characters usually just want to give them a standing character um, sort of um, canvas setting <clears throat> instead of a landscape. There isn't any land to be seen and there is no side movement of the head required to look at this object, this, this person in front of us. When we look at a human being standing in front of us, do we move our head up and down or side to side? No, we nod our head, we go from their head down to their feet, and so that's how the canvas should be. The canvas should be long and vertical. If we're looking at a landscape, a, a mountainside, we move our head from side to side so that we can see the sides and our periphery vision, because that's how small we are and that's how large the object is. So that canvas has to naturally be a horizontal canvas. <clears throat> so you're using right now a horizontal canvas for a vertical line of sight, you don't really need to do that. You just give us a vertical canvas for a vertical line of sight. 
And that's it for today. I'll be looking at this next time. Um, this is a whole color issue, and I'm not going to touch on color today. I don't have time for that. But uh, if you want your paint overs back, please let me know. And please do finish your 14-day challenges. Um, uh, if you start it, go for it. Go for the, the end game. You're, you're going to thank yourself for it. When was the last time you drew a face 14 days in a row? And you'll, you'll be amazed at how much improvement you see.